I am Jean-Marie Guéhenno, the director of the Kent Global Leadership Program on Conflict Resolution at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. And I am very pleased to moderate a panel on Ukraine and the European security architecture. We have a remarkable set of panelists from the European Union, from Russia, and from the United States. Uh, I will not uh, introduce each of them because you, you can see their biographies uh, on the program and uh, uh, just explaining all they have done would take too much time because they're all really very experienced uh, experts. Uh, one practical word on the questions. Uh, you have on your screen a Q&A function. If you want to ask a question, uh, use that Q&A function, not the chat uh, function. And if you want to appear on the screen as you uh, ask the question, uh, type ASK in capital letters, A-S-K, uh, and we'll uh, try to do justice to your uh, request. Now, on the substance of our discussion, uh, the crisis that we are discussing today has been brewing for a long time. Uh, some would say since 2007, when President Putin made an important speech at the Munich Security Conference, in which he expressed his dissatisfaction with the European order that emerged uh, after the end of the Cold War, and his dissatisfaction about the place of Russia in that new order. But the crisis has taken a new dimension in the last few months with a considerable concentration of Russian forces around Ukraine, including in Belarus, and the publication by Russia of two draft treaties that present an alternative vision of European security. Until yesterday, many observers, especially in Europe, were of the view that uh, these deployments were just a way, maybe a dangerous way, for Russia to get attention and kickstart serious uh, negotiations. Uh, and uh, President Biden, uh, his Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, President Macron, Chancellor Scholz, uh, President Zelensky, all expressed a willingness to actively engage uh, with Russia. The developments of the last 24 hours are changing that perception. The decision of Russia to recognize the de facto republics of Luhansk and Donetsk has been characterized by the Secretary General of the United Nations as a violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And Russian troops have crossed the, have since crossed the internationally recognized uh, border of Ukraine. So the Ukraine crisis uh, is becoming a crisis, not about, not a way to call attention, not a crisis just about the European security ar architecture, but about some fundamental principles uh, of uh, international relations. Uh, I would like to, to start this discussion by asking the panelists how in that context they see the new steps and I will first turn to Fyodor Lukyanov. Uh, you have often said, uh, Fyodor, that the crisis was about much more than Ukraine. Uh, but President Putin, in his speech yesterday, spoke mostly about Ukraine. And he seemed actually quite emotional about it, uh, suggesting that Ukraine, built from bits and pieces, was, uh, well, I'm sure it was a really a country. Uh, and listening to, to the president, uh, one could not help but wonder whether that vision of Ukraine and of the Russian identity uh, left much space for the broader ambition of uh, negotiating a revised security architecture of Europe. And is the focus on Ukraine compatible with the broader ambition uh, that uh, I mean, he's present, for instance, in the two draft treaties uh, that he has presented. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean-Marie. Uh, thank you for this invitation. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the timing uh, suddenly turned to be extremely uh, interesting. 
so to start with uh, uh, your question, uh, I will be frank. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, at this point uh, what is the proportion of those two issues in the uh, whole uh, package of circumstances which emerged uh, a couple of months ago uh, and uh, started with the Russian demand for security guarantees. Uh, as, as all of us remember, the initial impetus was given by President Putin himself when he spoke at the foreign ministry uh, openly. And this is, by the way, quite interesting, the new, uh, new characteristic of Russian diplomacy that everything uh, is extremely open. It's like almost like uh, the Bolsheviks after the revolution, despite the fact that Putin yesterday sharply and hardly criticized just them for what they did. Uh, I think that, uh, in fact, those two issues are very much intertwined. Uh, the background uh, is, of course, about security arrangements in Europe after the Cold War, which uh, have been widely discussed uh, in recent uh, weeks and months uh, in Russia as well. And this notion about uh, what uh, has been promised to Gorbachev were not promised uh, during uh, two plus four negotiations and uh, uh, later on during uh, negotiations about Paris Charter for New Europe. Uh, so, of course, the starting point for this crisis is there. Uh, the very fact that uh, Soviet and then Russian leadership uh, accepted the new order in Europe, but uh, to put it mildly, not wholeheartedly and not uh, with a big enthusiasm uh, due to circumstances that Soviet Union and especially Russia after that was no, not at all in the position to try to insist on something else. But then it started to change gradually and uh, even uh, at the end of uh, President Yeltsin's rule, President Yeltsin's term, and uh, Stephen uh, can tell more about this because he was actively involved in American diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Russia at that time. Uh, the notion about uh, NATO enlargement uh, was uh, uh, pretty uh, severe in, in Russian debate, even at that time. Uh, not to talk about later period, so you mentioned uh, Vladimir Putin's Munich speech and so on. Uh, so in this regard, yes, indeed, I, I, I believe that this is about uh, European security. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this issue is uh, very much connected to the Ukrainian uh, story because it was just Ukraine which uh, manifested the culmination of the principle which was laid down in, in the... Uh, in, in diplomatic efforts in early 1990s. At that time, uh, almost no one could even imagine that discussions about European security and NATO might uh, reach uh, to <laughs> that, that far that Ukraine would be discussed. But uh, the principle uh, at that time, which, which was laid down, uh, to rephrase it, of course, it was not written in Paris Charter, but to rephrase it uh, and to follow what happened after, uh, NATO is equal to European security. The more NATO, the more European security. Uh, and when this principle reached to the uh, area which uh, uh, has been perceived uh, by Russia as highly sensitive and highly uh, uh, problematic uh, from the point of view of security, but of course not only security. And the, it's... Um, naive to deny that Ukraine is not uh, just another foreign country for Russia. Ukraine is something completely different. And I remember my very long uh, discussions with American and European friends in 2000s and the beginning of 2010s, when I tried to convince them that uh, uh, Ukraine should be treated differently than other East European states with regard to membership in European and Euro-Atlantic Euro institutions. 
And I heard all the time the same argument, actually, many times that, okay, guys, we feel your pain. We understand how difficult it should be for you. But you know, uh, when uh, uh, Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary joined NATO, Russia was uh, against that, but accepted. When Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania joined, Russia was furious, but accepted. It will be the same with Ukraine. When I said, no, it will not be the same with Ukraine, because Ukraine is not Poland and not Lithuania for Russia, they simply believed I was too excited. But then it, it turned out to be like this. So uh, in this regard, this Ukrainian issue combined with the NATO enlargement and the broader the European security arrangement as they emerged after the Cold War, that created this uh, uh, environment which is extremely explosive anymore. And uh, finally, not to monopolize too, too much time, uh, the Ukraine per se, yes, indeed, uh, we see uh, clearly that Vladimir Putin is uh, uh, extremely focused on, on Ukraine since, uh, since quite, quite, uh, quite a while. And his article <coughs> written uh, uh, last year uh, was <coughs> more or less uh, uh, complete narrative as he would love to see it, uh, the narrative about Ukrainian history. What he said yesterday <clears throat> was continuation of that. It was quite an interesting emphasis on just the Soviet period and the communist rule. And uh, he criticized communists even before. He never was a big fan of, of the communist idea. But this time it was quite exceptional that he basically stated that the whole problem with the collapse of uh, the historical space of Russia for, was caused by Bolsheviks and communists from the beginning, from Lenin national policy until the end with the reckless and uh, stupid uh, leadership of communist party in the uh, 1980s. So in this regard, it seems that uh, uh, those issues are very much uh, connected in his mind and he sees it as actually uh, two, two, two sides of the same coin. And this coin should be converted into something else. And that, that is seen by him as uh, probably his historical duty. Thank you. Thank you, Fyodor. Uh, Stephen Sistanovich, I mean, uh, you have been watching Russia uh, for, and the Soviet Union before for your whole career. And you also as uh, Fyodor Lukyanov just uh, reminded us, I mean, you, you have played a role in the US government, uh, an important role. Uh, how do you see the next steps in this situation? And uh, do you agree with the genesis as it was described by Fyodor Lukyanov? Well, <laughs> Jean-Marie, thank you for organizing this and for getting together such a good group. Um, the question that you pose to Fyodor is, uh, you know, how did this uh, controversy, which began by being about the European security order and architecture turn into uh, a sole focus, it seems, on, uh, on Ukraine? And I think the answer has to be that really for the past many months uh, and even longer, but especially last year when the the Russian way of talking about this took a, a particular turn. It hasn't been too clear whether Russian officials and policymakers were really interested in the European security order or interested in, um, you know, uh, taking, breaking uh, the Ukrainian state. Um, now, people like Fyodor in uh, smart, reasonable, thoughtful people in Moscow were all hoping that really it was about the European security order and that there could be a diplomatic process launched that would address all kinds of security concerns, typical arms control negotiations and so forth that would produce uh, you know, the 2.0 version of the post-Cold War uh, order. But 
it has turned out that actually there, it seems looking at uh, President Putin's speech yesterday, that the focus is less the European security order and more a kind of obsession with Ukraine as an illegitimate state uh, that makes it almost impossible to imagine serious negotiations about this uh, question. You know, as Western leaders have said over the past month or so or more, uh, you know, you want to talk about European security, be my guest. This is fine. We can talk about that. We may not agree. There are certain things we may simply be unable to accept in your view, but we're really ready for that discussion. What they've heard yesterday, though, was an approach to this problem that is, you know, I mean, to be very blunt about it, driven by hysterical ethno-nationalist um, views um, a, and a readiness to authorize criminal aggression in the, in the name of those views. Uh, and I think the result of this, tragically, will be a much more contentious European security architecture, uh, an a Russian security environment that is much more negative for Russia. Uh, and it makes one wonder whether what we're seeing is a kind of breakdown of a contradictory diplomacy that Putin was pursuing from the beginning. Uh, where he couldn't quite get straight what the balance was between agreements that he wanted to negotiate with, the, with Western governments and a, a desire to uh, control Ukraine, because those are obviously at odds with each other. And as it became clear that uh, Western governments were quite united on these issues, he found himself boxed in and unable to come up with uh, any way of standing down other than the approach that he's taken, which is, you know, the let's just recognize these people's republics. Uh, I like the Stalinist overturn, overtones of that term, by the way. Uh, let's just recognize these people's republics and maybe that will be the end of it. But, but maybe not. Uh, I think the likelihood is that even this action is going to trigger new confrontation uh, and may not and it may not be the end of what uh, uh, the Russian government has in mind. Today, for example, they've been un a little bit unclear as to what the borders of the People's Republics are that they're recognizing. Uh, it seems as though maybe it's just to be the current lines that are um, the area controlled by the uh, by the People's Republic authorities, but but we don't know. At any rate, I, I think what has been triggered here is a kind of uh, a crisis that grows out of uh, the way in which Putin's two goals, uh, getting the US and NATO governments to agree to a different security architecture and gaining control of Ukraine have been at odds with each other. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Kadri uh, Leek, you are working for the uh, European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, you are also an Estonian, uh, so very close to what's happening uh, now. And uh, you also know Russia very well. Uh, so what's your analysis watching the crisis unfold from Europe? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, including me in this fantastic group. As to my analysis, well, I am puzzled. And I have been puzzled ever since the weekend when the events took an unexpected turn for me, and I'm still struggling to make sense of it. Earlier, I thought I more or less understood um, to the extent one, one can, so there are big reservations and caveats and that anyway, but I thought I sort of understood what we were dealing with. Indeed, I mean, Russia had raised um, two issues that concerned 
it one was Ukraine, the other was the question of order. Uh, both had been growing over the past years. I mean, the order question because the Paris Charter has some contradictory clauses. It says that every country has the right to choose their own alliances. It also says that security needs to be indivisible and no one must enhance its security at the expense of others. And these two clauses, I think, can simultaneously be true only if the continent by large is full free and at peace, more or less. They become contradictory as soon as that is not the case. And that clearly is no longer the case now that Russia defines its security interests in ways that are totally at odds with those of, of Europe. So I think the order <coughs> issue is, is somewhat problematic anyway, and Russia has been feeling that increasingly. And then, of course, the Ukraine, mm, no, <clears throat> the Ukraine issue, but I think Moscow had hoped that Minsk agreements assigned in 2015 would give it some control over Ukraine's political choices. Moscow, President Putin himself had been negotiating these agreements. They are cleverly drafted in ways that benefit Moscow. And Moscow defended them very harshly. Uh, they have repeatedly made clear that they, don't, they won't allow uh, to review these agreements, to dilute them, uh, change, so forth. But I think over the last year, they saw that Ukraine under President Zelensky was starting to drift away. They, uh, they proposed to renegotiate the agreements to bring more powers into the Normandy group. President Zelensky started widening the agenda, speaking about Crimea, and none of that could go down well in for Kremlin. And that's why I think the initial escalation, the mobilization around borders started. It was sort of to warn and put pressure um, uh, <clears throat> on Ukraine first and foremost, but, but then increasingly also to the West. And I think that after the Geneva summit with Biden, probably President Putin identified in Biden someone with whom he could talk. And Biden is someone who actually represents the West, who can speak on behalf of the West. And that is a rare commodity these days among politicians. In the Trump era, there was no such person. I mean, Trump couldn't represent Merkel. Merkel couldn't represent Trump. If you wanted to talk to the West, you, you lacked the phone number. Uh, Biden, Biden's number is, is the one. And then I think that's part of the reason why Russia really tried to open the wide diplomatic front. Uh, <clears throat> vis-a-vis -vis the US, but also in ways that included Ukraine. And I think until last week, they were trying to negotiate the free basket simultaneously. Uh, Fyodor has described it in some of his interviews. I quite agreed with his analysis that there was sort of renewed interest in Minsk agreements that was supposed to give Moscow some leverage over Ukraine. Then I think Moscow was about to accept the proposal to have arms control negotiations. And then many of us have suspected that some behind the scenes discussions were also going on <clears throat> about NATO enlargement and how to find a tacit agreement or, or formulation that would sort of take the heat off the issue because it's not in the agenda anyway right now. And I really do not know what happened last week. When, when Russia suddenly decided it didn't need Minsk agreement any longer and went for recognition of the republics. Exactly one week ago, last Tuesday, President Putin said that there are unused opportunities in the Minsk agreement. We should continue with diplomatic path. And I, maybe he lied to us, but I, I don't see a reason for that. I mean, if he didn't have a reason to even raise this. So, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled. What, what happened? What made Russia to change tactics and go for recognition? Um, and yes, what are the next steps? Um, will they continue to advance militarily from there? Or will they want to be in speaking terms with the West? 
Uh, that would suggest that they stay within the borders of these republics. They won't take their military any further. They might use the border question um, to put further pressure on Ukraine, um, but they would still try to negotiate on some of these other files. So yes, long story short, I, I, I struggle to make sense of the latest developments. Thank you, Kadri. Uh, Sam, uh, Sharap, uh, at the RAND Corporation, you, you published a, a very ambitious uh, vision of what could have been. Uh, clearly, today, we are in a different world. How do you, how do you see it? And uh, how do you explain this evolution? Um, well, thank you so much, Jean-Marie, for uh, the invitation. Uh, fantastic panel, and uh, apologies for being a few minutes late. Um, so uh, one piece that has been missing from our discussion so far is the nature of the military buildup that has been ongoing since um, the late fall. And that is the only, with the partial exception of the you know two week winter holiday where there seemed to be a little bit pa of pause, but that has been an extremely coherent, uh, extremely um, uh, consistent with what we would expect if Russia were preparing to mount a large scale military operation in Ukraine, all the pieces coming together, um, going far beyond what you would need to merely apply coercive diplomatic pressure down to the point of, you know, field hospitals, blood supplies, uh, and so on. Uh, so, you know, that has been proceeding apace all along. And so that is the one piece that has been consistent. What has been inconsistent is the political messaging, arguably until yesterday when the at least first 85% of the, of the speech that we heard was in fact consistent with the military posturing because it suggests an ambitions that go far beyond the so-called people's republics. Uh, that speech was first and foremost about Ukraine, not about the Donbass. Um, and, you know, what Russia is poised militarily to have the option of being able to do right now goes far beyond the Donbass. The military buildup has not been along the part of the border that uh, is, you know, adjacent to the uh, separatist held, the non-government, non-Ukrainian government controlled areas. You know, just one other piece of uh, data there. So, you know, I think we need, those are sort of hard facts that have been ongoing. Uh, and need to be incorporated into any analysis of the broader political dynamics. Um, and so just to take it one step back, um, I think there is a way to square the circle of this seeming contradiction between um, Russia's uh, direct military focus on Ukraine and the speech yesterday about Ukraine and the sort of diplomatic focus about broader European security issues. Um, and that is that basically there's only one uh, set of issues that Russia is willing to go to war over when it comes to European security. And that relates to its uh, neighbors that are not already in uh, NATO and the EU, the non-Baltic former Soviet republics and their status. And we've seen that consistent over time. You know, Georgia 2008, Ukraine 2014 and onwards and, uh, and uh, you know, what we're seeing right now. So Russia did not like the European security order um, that uh, relates to, say, the uh, EU and NATO within its current membership, but it could live with it. It wasn't willing to go to war to alter it. However, it is willing to uh, go to war to alter or to have a say in the order as concerns the states on its immediate periphery, um, which links to your question about our publication. But I'll get back to that in one second. Um, so. Uh, it, the way I understood the combination of the military uh, buildup and this diplomatic um, uh, offer that was made in, or proposal or you know draft treaty, depending on your perspective in late in mid-December, um, well, two, two things. It's possible that it was just a time buying exercise and that really the military planning, which has proceeded again pretty consistently all along, uh, uh, was hadn't quite reached the point where they needed it to be. And so this was sort of a way of throwing some um, uh, a wrench in the gears of the Western response to the military buildup by having everyone focus on the diplomacy. That's a plausible hypothesis. It is also possible that Russia was basically saying, look, 
we're prepared to negotiate on the on the rules, the fundamental rules of European security. Um, first and foremost, as they concern Ukraine and uh, others of our neighbors, or we're going to take Ukraine by force if necessary. And that appears to be the uh, the choice that Western governments were given. Um, and uh, it's a really you know difficult uh, position to have <laughs> put uh, governments in, of course. Uh, and um, but that I fear is the uh, the way of squaring the circle of the relationship between the broader European security order, Russia's uh, concerns about it, and Ukraine. That you know, if you're not prepared to negotiate with us, we have this other option, and we're prepared to exercise it. Uh, that is, you know, physically um, altering uh, the at least you know changing the nature of the political system, um, perhaps in Ukraine. So uh, uh, in the short term, I don't see. Um, the uh, crisis ending with the recognition of the republics and, um, uh, you know, the other 190,000 troops just going home without any, you know, broader concessions on, on Ukraine status. I, I, I have, a, I, I think that this is essentially the next stage in what will be a broader escalation. I sincerely hope I'm wrong. Um, but uh, to get back to your initial question, Jean-Marie, about uh, the, the, the publication that uh, a project that I led um, where we tried to get folks from all the stakeholders, so to speak, from the countries uh, together to try to see if we couldn't come up with an alternative to uh, the current um, disputed regional order. Um, my driving concern going into that was that basically the status quo ante where both Russia and the West were pursuing 100% mutually incompatible agendas in these states along Russia's periphery, um, uh, was eventually going to make any broader, um, you know, uh, first of all, it was going to cause lots of problems for the states themselves and make broader, you know, relations on global issues and other issues of concern between Russia and the West impossible, that it would lead to a permanent cycle of crises uh, and that we needed to have some um, mutually abided by set of rules uh to govern behavior and what we tried to do in that project was basically model what it might be like to do a multilateral negotiation on these issues to tell all the participants listen put the status quo out of your head try to think about what we could achieve if the states involved were um to sit down and try to negotiate on these sets of issues what might be a mutually acceptable compromise and we came up with one idea it's not perfect by any means it wouldn't be what i would have written if i had been writing myself but we had to get 2019 or 18 other folks to sign off on the same document including russians and ukrainians and georgians and you know europeans and so on um so uh, involved a fair amount of compromise but i think for that reason it's it's still valuable and that it points out one potential set of arrangements that plausibly could be at least considered by all parties. Thank Not you. Not a short-term proposition, I should mention, in the current political environment. Thank you. So, <clears throat> in a way, Sorry, you're all... could I could I interject here? Go ahead. Go ahead. There is one way of resolving the uh, these this duality of Putin's aims that's different from uh, from Sam's, and that is that the big buildup is actually a bluff, uh, that he thought the coercive potential of it was so great that he could get a lot of concessions without actually having to invade. And I wonder whether Fyodor thinks, and, and that he chose, um, once he, his bluff was essentially called by Western governments, he had to decide what to do. And he's decided to do this little thing instead. And I wonder whether, I mean, and Sam points out all the reasons to think that isn't right. On the other hand, if you're Putin and you've been bluffing and you really don't want to launch a complete war, then maybe this is your way out of it. And I wonder whether Fyodor thinks that's where we are. Fyodor, do you want to answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I belong to those who insisted from the beginning, and we argued with some many times in the uh, chats, that uh, it was not a preparation for war. Uh, 
as Stephen just mentioned. Uh, you may call it bluff, you may call it uh, more elegantly, but... Uh, yeah, but that, that's what it is, right? Yeah, that, that, that's what uh, it was designed for, to make uh, an impression that uh, Russian Federation is ready to go as far as possible. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, all this... Um, um, uh, terrible pictures in, in Western media from intelligence. Uh, I, I have my doubts about US intelligence, but uh, if we assume that it was uh, correct, then if you're seriously bluffing, you need to bluff in full scale uh, uh, details. So uh, as for the, uh, uh, the conclusion uh, Stephen made uh, that uh, this bluff didn't work and uh, then uh, the president decided to, to do a little thing, uh, I'm not sure it's correct because uh, first of all, uh, are we sure that the bluff didn't work? So at least uh, if we judge uh, on the public atmosphere in the West, it worked perfectly well, maybe even more than it, it should. And secondly, uh, frankly, I don't believe that the game is over. Uh, yes, a recognition of uh, those uh, territories yesterday uh, was uh, unexpected by most of people. And uh, I unfortunately <laughs> must confess that I, I also believe that Minsk agreements were uh, really uh, a very important part, a very important element of the whole plan. Uh, probably I was wrong, or uh, the president and his team decided that it was impossible to achieve, which, which I actually share, because the Minsk agreement uh, was so tricky uh, composed that um, uh, I think in Ukraine, uh, whatever we think about the leadership, they were aware that implementation of Minsk agreement will, will change the nature of the state profoundly. And uh, yeah. So, but now uh, I don't believe that uh, we should expect end of the game. And this, uh, those indications made today by the Putin uh, about uh, this ambiguity of uh, borders and other things of the, those newly recognized sovereign states. Uh, of course, it, uh, it does not mean that Russian army will go to fight and to liberate uh, occupied territories. Mm, certainly not. But uh, to uh, follow exactly <clears throat> what uh, President Putin said uh, initially uh, at the meeting in the foreign ministry, that we need to keep a relatively high degree of tension to get <clears throat> Americans and others to, to listen to what we are uh, trying to say, I think it st still works. And uh, <clears throat> with what, whatever uh, I personally think about this methodology, but uh, one thing for me is uh, correct. Uh, all attempts by Russia in previous years to offer uh, a more or less normal discussion about security arrangements in Europe were simply ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could add I... quickly a two finger on that score. Um, if uh, so, I, I, I sincerely hope Fyodor's right. And Steve, I, I take it that that's your uh, view too, that it might well be a bluff. Or uh, and I, you know, we should all admit that basically we all have no idea. Or there, there are uh, pieces, contradictory pieces of evidence. But even if you ignore the military buildup, there are two uh, other factors that I think uh, make me pessimistic. One is that what you know by basically um, abandoning the Minsk agreements. Uh, and Putin himself declared them, quote unquote, dead today, uh, Russia has given up the tool that it had achieved for cementing its influence over Ukraine in, on the battlefield in 2015. Uh, and so the idea that it would just sort of throw away its leverage over Ukraine and accept control over the 3% of its territory seems to me uh, difficult to square with the logic of Russian policy, as I understand, or maybe logic is the wrong word, but the, the objectives of Russian policy. And the second point is that uh, to believe that Russia would continue with half measures, so to speak, or, or small moves, I don't know what exactly, little things, I believe was the term that was used, uh, it would be to suggest that they haven't come to the conclusion that eight years of little things hadn't done the trick. And it seemed to me that that's what we're, you know, where 
the point that was reached before we uh, went down this path with this quite severe crisis. Sorry, I'll leave it there. Mm. Can I, I briefly to, come in to? Uh, uh, Kari, I, would, I wanted yeah. to, to actually give you the floor, but adding a question that has been asked by the audience by Thomas Weiss, actually, who asked, to what extent is Putin's claim justified that Ukraine is a fiction created by the Soviet Union and not a state? Because in a way, we come back to the issue that is so much in evidence in uh, President Putin's speech. I mean, this very dismissive view of Ukraine as a state, which is part of whether one can be an optimist or a pessimist on the next step. But over to you, Kadri. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um... What I wanted to say, that's a good question. I'll answer that one too. But what I wanted to say earlier, I um, I also don't think that Putin needed um, a face-saving way uh, out um, and and that he recognized the independence of Europe for, for that reason, because um, this crisis is his creation from the start to, to finish. A to Z. So he could have turned up and down heat as he pleases. I mean, in many other occasions, he really is sort of pride obsessed and, and retreat is hard for him. We have seen that repeatedly, but not, I think, on he, this occasion. But that was really sort of his theater. And, and I think he, he could have done what he wanted and he could have kept the mobilization going. I mean, it is expensive, true, but, but that's something that Russia can, can afford, especially if it is giving some diplomatic results. And I, I agree with Fyodor that something, you know, something that Russia could interpret as success has been happening. The West is discussing the question of European order in terms that was not the case earlier. And um, there is some sort of real urgency and diplomatic energy being in, in, invested in, in those things. Uh, so that's what puzzles me. And, and another thing also, I don't think that Putin was really so intimidated by Western unity. I think that's, that's one aspect that also here in Europe people often get wrong. Everyone is impressed by our uh, unity and think that Putin must be impressed too. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think... He expected anything else. Secondly, I I don't think he would benefit from this unity. Quite vice versa. I mean, if he wants to agree a new European order, then it's best agreed with United Europe and America. Um, and when it comes to sort of splits in 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 the Western camp. Um, also, you know, especially in English language world, it's often discussed that France or Germany might go soft and, and make a deal with Putin. I don't think they have anything to offer Putin that Putin wants, apart from, yeah, the role they played uh, around Minsk agreements. Um, but that's, that's, that's a smaller piece of a puzzle in the end. So, and they are much more... You know, they're much more principled than some people also think, you know, I, neither France nor Germany is chiefly motivated by economic interests, as, as sometimes it is thought. So I think basically what, what, what the Kremlin's aim could have been was to reach, uh, reach agreement with President Biden and have all of Europe sign up to it, uh, which Europe would have had little choice um, but to accept, so just wanted to add these nuances. But Ukraine, yes, I think Ukraine is the one country that, that, that Putin really gets wrong, in my view. In many other things, I think he's actually, I think his assessments are quite sober, if, if bordering cynical. Uh, and and he's, he, he's, usually he has quite, good command of detail and I mean for someone who has been a power for so long he he's doing good job but Ukraine in my view he simply does not get I I sometimes think that it would do good to him to go and travel in Ukraine incognito talk to people feel the atmosphere have a drink um, go to karaoke uh, see what the place is like I think there are many myths um, 
about Ukraine in Russia and, and partly also in the West. The whole concept that um, Ukraine is a country split in two, I don't think that's the case. I think Ukraine has like 10 or so regional identities, uh, all different, uh, all happily part of one country, all um, quite unruly, uh, all despise Kiev and central government. Uh, it's a very anarchic country. Um, and it's also, it's also structured in ways that are quite the opposite to Russia. I mean, Russia is top-down country. Ukraine is bottom-up country. Ukraine has very strong society, very weak political elites. Russia is the opposite. So it's in a way, no wonder that, that these two countries find it hard to, to understand each other. And especially, of course, for President Putin, who, whose otherwise adequate worldview seems to be blind, seems to have some blind spots. And, and he tends to exaggerate the importance of special services and dismiss the importance of societies in, in world events. So it's no wonder that he gets the place wrong. Fyodor, what do you think of Putin's view of Ukraine? Can he be, uh, can he change his view? <laughs> no, he certainly can change his view, <clears throat> as he probably can change any of his views. Uh, it rarely happens to people after a certain age, and I think we all of us are not uh, <laughs> exclu excluded from this phenomenon. Uh, I uh, yes, I I think that the perception of uh, Ukraine in Russia is distorted. I, I would agree, but I would uh, also agree with uh, Kadri that the perception of Ukraine in the West is pretty distorted too. We speak, uh, at least to the point we could speak <laughs> all of us, uh, to different people in Ukraine, very much different. Mm -hmm. uh, we speak, uh, Westerners are inspired by uh, pro-democracy, civil rights, civil society activists uh, who are uh, exactly like in uh, everywhere, in, in, in Poland, in Estonia, in Spain. Uh, Russians speak to uh, other Ukrainians, uh, but they are also Ukrainians. Uh, they um, feel very much uncomfortable with the uh, uh, what uh, um, other part of Ukraine, Ukrainians uh, uh, is inspired. So th this is a complicated country. And uh, uh, talking, uh, answering your uh, question or the question put in, uh, in, in our chat, uh, Jean-Marie, Jean about uh, whether Putin is correct in his uh, description of Ukrainian history. I don't think he's correct, but that's, that, that's an important thing that, uh, any historical narrative is a construct. How Russia constructs narrative of uh, Ukrainian or our common history is of course uh, constructed. Same with Ukrainian narrative about their own history. So it's, no, it's not uh, big news that any nation tries to construct its, hist uh, its history according to what they wish to present. The very fact that Ukraine in current borders was created during the Soviet time is undeniable. That's, that's true. Uh, you can make different conclusions out of that, and Putin makes his conclusions. But uh, uh, in, in the West and in, in the United States, maybe especially very far away from, from Ukraine, uh, the, the, uh, the, there is another simplistic picture of Ukraine. So we have different but simplistic pictures. Yes, uh, Stephen. Yeah, it, 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 just the question of Ukraine and its current borders really requires a comment because Russia has never ever had its current borders either. The borders of Russia are a, an artifact uh, of the um, breakup of the Soviet Union. The borders of almost all countries in Eastern Europe are an artifact of the end of World War II. Uh, in a lot of cases, that was associated with ethnic cleansing. If you decide that you want to change the borders of uh, the countries of the former Soviet Union or others in Eastern Europe, 
you have to cope with the prospect of enormous instability and ethnic cleansing and conflict. And that's why everybody at the end of the Cold War said, okay, we are going to find a way to live with this. And Putin has a completely different concept, which is you can go into the history of the past millennium, or you can go into the history of this past century, but really it is to come to, the, to arrive at the conclusion that Ukraine is not just an artificial state, but an illegitimate state that the leadership of Ukraine is always a criminal conspiracy controlled by other governments. I mean, he really says this all the time now. That's the, that's the meaning of that article that he wrote last summer, is that the Ukraine government is a bunch of traitors and they do not have a right to speak for Ukraine. On that basis, you can't have any European security architecture that uh, other governments in Europe will accept. You can have lots of different European security architectures, but you can't have one that is based on the premise that Ukraine does not have a right to exist. And that unfortunately is Putin's position right now. Now he can have his position and decide he's not going to make war about it. Uh, and that's what I think is a possible <laughs> way in which this crisis may be resolved. That's my bluff scenario. His bluff was called. He doesn't have a good option other than war. So he's now going to settle for his mad ravings and fight another mm -hmm. day. He will be very mad and he will try to find ways of getting even. And that may be the way in which we see the next phase of the crisis, you know, trying to avenge his defeat this time. Your point, uh, Stephen, on borders is the point that was made by the ambassador of Kenya last night in the meeting of the Security Council, uh -huh. where he framed the issue of Ukraine. I mean, he, he compared it to the breakup of the colonial empires in Africa and said that, well, the African states had decided that if they were going to open the issue of borders, this would lead to an in, enormous conflicts everywhere in Africa. And of course, borders can be, I mean, the question from a historical standpoint, but it was better not to open that kind of worms. And I think it was an interesting intervention because it went way beyond Europe. Mm -hmm. And it showed that there is an interest in having some foundation for a stable order. And that implies not changing borders by any other thing that mm -hmm. a, a real agreement between sovereign states. That used to be Putin's position as well in, in his Munich. earlier years. Yeah. yeah, I I was just going through my old files and I found um, in 2005, um, my a friend of mine, an Estonian journalist asked a question at press conference from Putin asking, you know, why is it so hard for Moscow to apologize for occupation in May 2005 and Putin's reply, it sort of also started rambling about history and he said, but basically the message was that, you know, we all have grievances, should we really focus on it? Russia has its grievances. You want to say what, that we should take back Crimea or that's nonsense. Uh, and now we are where we are. So I, I want um, Fyodor might be able to answer, why is that? I mean, what's happened to him? Is that the sort of overall disillusionment in his, relationship with the West that I can understand, or is there something something more that has made him to focus on Ukraine in this totally qualitatively different manner recently? And before you answer, uh, Fyodor, uh, I would uh, insert a question that is indirectly related to the question of Kadri, because uh, in the audience, someone asked whether the February 4th accord between Russia and China indicated a turning point in Russia's approach that this Eurasian partnership makes the threats of economic warfare from Atlantic countries much more bearable. So in other words, that the, Russia can now have a more a bolder policy because of the, also the international context. Uh, as, as for this uh, meeting, Putin's visit to Beijing and meeting with Xi and uh, signing of the joint declaration, declaration was uh, 
pretty uh, much bigger than usually. So that's true. But uh, I don't believe that it had uh, any decisive role to play. Uh, to some extent, yes, of course, when you have backing of uh, the uh, actually uh, next uh, biggest or almost biggest uh, economy and uh, superpower in the world, uh, you feel a little bit more, more confident than if you don't have this backing. But I don't believe that uh, Russia's uh, uh, motivation vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine or other uh, states uh, in the post-Soviet, uh, former Soviet territory uh, ne ne needs uh, additional impetus from China. And China is, uh, chi China took uh, a position which is closer to Russian recently. So the one e spoke at the Munich Security Conference and for the first time he clearly stated that NATO enlargement is a bad thing. They prefer to avoid it uh, before, but now they are uh, very clear. And of course, they are very much disappointed with the American position about China. So they are more eager to, to listen to Russian, uh, Russian um, uh, narrative. So, but, but again, I, I think it's a factor, but I would not overestimate that. And uh, the question uh, why he changed, why Putin changed. You know, uh, uh, with all due respect uh, to my president, uh, whom I met several times at uh, well-known circumstances, and I had the privilege to, to watch him uh, pretty closely, uh, recent, uh, last time uh, in October last year. Uh, yes, I think he changed, uh, as every person changes with age and with uh, growing experience, and this experience is not necessarily very positive, as, as for all of us. But uh, I would not uh, believe that he is the, dri the only driver of international development. By far not. And uh, if we would look at uh, uh, a little bit broader context, and if we will ask why everything changed so much since uh, beginning of this century, I think we will find a lot of different, uh, different answers, sometimes contradictory, they contradicting each other, but all of them uh, work. Uh, and Putin was just part of this process. And uh, uh, we live now in a world which is completely different from uh, which uh, was created after the Cold War. Whether we like it or not, uh, some people, um, as uh, Stephen said, it was an uh, enormous attempt to overcome the past. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I, I went through this period from, I, I just, I was a student at the Moscow State University when everything began, and I was fantastically enthusiastic about changes in the Soviet Union, changes in Europe and so on. But now looking back, I understand that uh, the, the many, many things were done not wrong, but, but simply the, the logic of that development brought us to, to, to the situation we, we have now. And uh, talking about borders, I absolutely agree that any borders now are artificial, uh, almost any. Russia, absolutely, Russian configuration today is very strange, actually. So to be... Uh, to, Okay, I will, not, <laughs> I will not give examples, but, but what, what, I, what I thought recently that uh, if we take uh, any century in the European history, any, we will not find the, the only one where borders would not change profoundly, all of them. Why we believe that 21st century would be different, uh, that was uh, some kind of euphoria after the Cold War. I, I'm afraid we are back to the, to the normal in, in international relations. Yeah, but the normal- I don't say, I don't say it's good. I don't say yeah. it's good, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, because the normal in an age of nuclear weapons and uh, armed weapons of mass destruction uh, is, uh, is a dangerous normal. <laughs> and uh, the whole idea was to try to put the European architecture on a more stable, footing and would seem to be moving away from that. I see that we are coming to the end of our panel. Any of you who has a final thought to cheer us up? Uh, a scenario that 
look that leads to some kind of de-escalation, some kind of stabilization, rather than the the prospect that we have discussed for most of this hour. Floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, I don't know that there's a lot of grounds for optimism, Jean-Marie, unfortunately, but um, uh, the one thing I would say is that um, uh, it, it, it has been clear to me that um, for that Russia's focus on Ukraine is like second to national survival in, in national security priorities has been longstanding, predates Putin. Um, even if you look at the talk about the implications of NATO enlargement in the 1990s by senior Russian officials at the time, they brought this up as a sort of existential red line issue. Um, and so, I, you know, the obsession with Ukraine in a way is kind of consistent. The circumstances, as Fyodor mentions, have changed pretty dramatically since 2005 uh, on the continent. So I think maybe just uh, it's more that than anything else. The one thing I would say is that um, I, I don't uh think that the that the force posture the way it is is sustainable indefinitely it's not as though we're talking about forces that are in garrisons that are sustainable uh for the long term with a like logistics trail that's established even now we've seen move you know movement out out of temporary barracks into the woods essentially on on the uh satellite photos that have uh that proliferate on social media now uh, not only. Um, so I just think we can't ignore that. Um, and uh, uh, even though it goes against all my prior assumptions about how Russia and Putin think about the use of force, um, uh, because this would be such a departure from past practice that it's hard. It has been hard for me to accept. <laughs> um, but uh, in other words, because past practice has been a sort of minimal sufficiency approach to the use of force. Um, Russia did not employ a fraction of its capabilities in the, in the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Um, it could very well have, but chose to sort of have some sort of not quite plausible deniability about it, um, uh, just as one case in point. Um, but this is really, uh, you know, qualitatively different in terms of what it looks like. And so I certainly hope that uh, that Stephen, basically that all of you are right and I'm wrong, um, <laughs> that this is a bluff, um, but uh, I, I, it just doesn't look that way. Thank you. Jean-Marie, let me say one thing, because uh, Sam is absolutely right about the long interest in Ukraine, but I think it's also important to understand how it's changed and the escalation of the, uh, rhetoric about what Ukraine represents as a threat to Russia. You know, in the meeting yesterday with the Security Council, uh, the Defense Minister Shoigu said Ukraine is planning nuclear rearmament. Uh, Patrushev said Ukraine aims at the destruction of Russia. Matvienko said uh, what's going on there is genocide. This is really a kind of, this is not a security, a normal concern about security. This is hysteria. And I think this isn't gonna, that, that Sam may turn out to be right if, it, if that kind of thinking, that obsessive hysterical thinking continues. And that's why I'm going to point to Fyodor as somebody who has a special responsibility in his circle for challenging this kind of hysterical assessment. If Russia's view of Ukraine is captured in this, I, I will I use this word carefully, insane vocabulary, then things are only going to get worse. And what is necessary is for somebody to say to Putin, you have to take a deep breath, you have to realize where this hysteria leads and you have to rethink because otherwise Russia is hurtling toward a, an immense and destructive conflict with the rest of us. So there's a lot on your shoulders, Fyodor. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate this this, um, this uh, task. Uh, I think you you might be right, 
but uh, probably because I'm living in this environment and uh, became too cynical and I uh, follow the international communication and so study, um, teach a course in international fa um, information factor in international relations for my students, I would uh, believe that hysteria sometimes is staged and uh, this is a mean. Uh, it's not uh, elegant, but it's much better than the real one. So yeah, we hope if... that the bluff, we hope that hysteria is staged, that it's all theater, but that in the substance it will be calmer. Kadri, you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, some co additional causes for optimism for what they are worth. Um, I actually think that a real large scale war with Ukraine would be hugely unpopular in Russia among society as well as among elites. I mean, um, uh, people we saw yesterday, even they, uh, I think they look scared uh, rather than anything else. And I think it would be a huge stress test to the whole political system because also the elites are tired. You, you can see that when you do some interviews in Moscow and, and feel the atmosphere. So my assumption actually is that a large scale war in Ukraine would be the beginning of the end of Putin's rule. And I, I think he might know that. The Kremlin is conducting their own focus groups, opinion polls. The mood in the society does interest them. And I think that is actually one factor why they would want to avoid a large scale war. They can still do very ugly and awful things short of that, especially if we think of airstrikes um, and, and things like Greece, but there is, there is something in it. And secondly, also, I think Russia's view of Ukraine, um, ultimately that might change too. I mean, Putin indeed has been moving in one direction and, and getting much more obsessed about Ukraine. But I was struck, for instance, when I was in Moscow in March 2018, it was fifth anniversary of Crimea and annexation, and there were some public cele <clears throat> celebrations, but I was interviewing future generation of diplomats, um, um, also with some other officials, um, some retired diplomats, and repeatedly I heard people acknowledge that our understanding of Ukraine didn't correspond to reality. So, you know, in some layers uh, of, of political elite far below Putin, there is a different understanding. And that might grow as, as, as time goes by. So what I suggest to Western politicians normally is that we, we need to buy time, but not until the ground unfreezes. I don't think that's, uh, that's, that's the uh, solution to our worries, but, but really until Moscow forms a different view of Ukraine. Thank you. I think we are going to have to end this conversation. Uh, I apologize uh, to, to those in the audience who couldn't ask questions. I tried to relay as many questions as possible, but uh, this was a very rich uh, discussion. I think the, the role of the uh, uh, Kent program, it's a com program on conflict resolution after all. <laughs> and so having that kind of very honest uh, discussion uh, is essential. Uh, uh, Stephen Sistanovich, <laughs> hasn't has tasked you you know with a very <laughs> challenging uh, task but i think it's important actually that the perspectives of all sides be understood uh, time and again during this conversation it was said well that uh, the west has a wrong view of ukraine russia has a wrong view of ukraine i think very often there is not that much understanding of the perspective uh, uh, each per each uh, country comes from. And so that is the purpose of that panel. That is the purpose of that kind of conversation. And so I thank you all for uh, being so candid and open in that conversation, which will have to be continued 
uh, and hopefully in the less dramatic uh, context than the one that we have today. So thank you.